Hi, I'm Roger Stenbach from the Portable Oscilloscope Marketing Group. This morning we'll be comparing the Philips PM3217 to the Tektronix 2215A. Now the Philips PM3217 is a 50 megahertz oscilloscope. It's an impressive looking instrument. It has 25 push button, I counted all of them. It has 19 knobs, four BNCs, and a very interesting color coding scheme. For instance, we have uh, white on black and green on black. And even with all of these uh, many controls and push buttons and very uh, attractive looking front panel, it lacks some very important features. First of all, it's only a 50 megahertz oscilloscope. Its maximum sweep speed with a times 10 magnification on is only 10 nanoseconds. There is no single sweep provided. There is no bandwidth limit provided. There is no beam find provided. There is no trigger light provided. And there is no camera bezel for the CRT. Now contrast this to the front panel of the 2215A. As a matter of fact, it only has three BNCs, eight switches, eight push buttons, and only 16 knobs. Yet its performance is vastly superior, as we'll see shortly. Now, the first thing we'll be looking at will be the CRT performance. And then we'll be looking at the triggering, the vertical amplifier, and then overall general performance and construction techniques in these two instruments. Let's first take a look now at the uh, display and CRT performance. Now, what I've done here is I've connected a 200 kilohertz sine wave, and let's turn up the intensity to maximum on each scope. Now, right away, I can look at these two displays, and to me, the Tectonics 2215A is brighter than the PM3217. Also, I've noticed that on a Tectonix 2215A, as I change my intensity from dim to bright, the scope stays in focus. But let's do the same thing on the PM3217 now. And I can see right here the trace is fuzzy, and I have to refocus it. It's refocused. And as I turn up the intensity, I don't know whether you can see this really clearly on your monitors, but the trace is very thick. It's about 0.2 divisions. And again, I have to refocus it at the high drive condition. Now, this can be a problem, especially when we're measuring high frequencies, where the waveforms are closely spaced. Let's take a look at the PM3217 now. And notice that the low drive condition, uh, we can distinguish the waveforms to some degree, but they're dim. Now, as I turn up the intensity, you can see that it is now a complete blur. Let's make that same test on a Tech 2215A. Here we are at our low drive condition. And you can distinguish the individual sine waves. Now, as I turn up the intensity, the trace remains sharp. So for trace brightness and trace quality and sharpness, the Tectonix 2215A is superior to the PM3217 from Philips. Now let's check the low repetition rate writing rate performance of these two instruments. Now to best illustrate this, uh, we've turned the room lights off. And we've got ourselves here a 20 nanosecond wide pulse running at 100 kilohertz. Now at this particular setting, uh, you can see that both scopes have a bright enough trace to make a measurement. But let's reduce the repetition rate and see which one of these two scopes has better writing rate. Here's a 10 kilohertz uh, uh, rep rate. And a close-up of the Tectonics 2215 will reveal that the trace is sharp. We can see the leading edge, and we can see the falling edge, and we could make a measurement on this. Let's take a look at the PM3217 now. And notice something very interesting. There is a bright spot at the very beginning of the trace. Well, this is an indication that the retrace is not blanked completely. And, uh, it also shows us that the z-axis amplifier is relatively slow. See how this, this area right in here? That's an indication that the z-axis amplifier is slow. There's movement right there. You can see it where my pencil is. OK. 
Now let's reduce the rep rate down to one kilohertz. Now notice on the PM3217, it may be possible with some imagination to see the rising and falling edge of the waveform, but at this particular stage, I would say that we've got a problem making out uh, uh, the waveform to make a measurement. Now let's take a look at the Tectonics 2215A. And here we can clearly see that uh, we have a rising and falling edge and we can still make a measurement. One of the reasons that the Tech 2215A has better writing rate than the Philips PM3217 is that it has a 14 kilovolt CRT and the PM3217 has only a 10 kilovolt uh, CRT. Let's uh, take a look at twiggering now. Uh, I have connected a 50 kilohertz sine wave and we'll be checking the basic trigger sensitivity. Now the basic trigger sensitivity is specced at a half a division for each of these instruments. Nevertheless, let's reduce the amplitude now and find at which place neither one of these scopes will trigger. Now both scopes have been adjusted for best possible triggering in their uh, automatic mode. Here we go. Here's about a two division signal and it's still triggered. Okay. Here's about a division signal and it's still triggered. About a half a division, still triggered. And by golly, they're making specs. And right there, the PM3217 is not triggering anymore. And let's find out what the equivalent amplitude is. And that is about uh, 1, 2, 3.2, so that would be 0 0.32 divisions. It's making specs. However, the Tech 2215A, let's take a look at it here, it still is triggered at a very low amplitude right here. It fails to trigger. And let's check it out. And that's 1, 2, so it's 0 0.2 divisions. So for basic trigger sensitivity then, the Tech 2215A triggers better than the Philips PM3217. Now let's check the high frequency triggering. Now I've connected a 60 megahertz signal now to each one of these scopes vertical system and uh, we'll be checking the trigger sensitivity at this frequency. Even though the PM3217 is only a 50 megahertz scope, both of them are specced at one and a half divisions at their bandwidth. Well, here we go. Both scopes are still triggering at uh, two divisions. And you can see that the PM3217 at one and a half divisions on a close-up here is uh, still triggered. Let's see where it fails to trigger. Here's about oh, 1.2 divisions or so, and right there it fails to trigger. I'll make a measurement. That's about 1.2 divisions where the scope fails to trigger. Contrast that to the trigger sensitivity of the Tectonics 2215A. A close-up will reveal that we have a nice solid trigger. The trace is bright. We come on down in our amplitude. The scope is still triggered, still triggered. And right about here, and that is about the equivalent of, oh, one, two, three, four, five and a half, so 0 0.55 divisions. So the Tech 2215A has superior high frequency trigger sensitivity over the Philips PM3217. Now the Philips PM3217 is the only one of the competitors oscilloscopes that features a peak-to-peak -peak auto trigger just like the Tech 2215A. However, uh, it does not have a single sweep mode which is available on the Tech 2215A and also the PM3217 features a separate B trigger input. Now let's uh, get into the vertical amplifier. Now the vertical amplifier is the heart of an oscilloscope. It is what displays your signals. We'll be checking two parameters, uh, overshoot, aberration, and distortion, and dynamic range. Let's check the overshoot and aberrations now. Now I've applied a 10 division signal from a PG502, which has a fairly nice square wave coming out of it. And uh, it's also a fast rise square wave. Notice that uh, in a 10 division signal, each major division would then equal 10%. So the overshoot and aberrations right here at the leading edge 
is less than about 2% on the Tectonix 2215A. Notice also if I position this trace over the CRT that the uh, distortion does not get worse as a function of positioning. A very nice vertical amplifier system. Now let's take a look at that same signal on a PM3217. Uh, right away we see some very interesting things going on. The, the whole front corner is rolled off, which is about 10% roll off right here. And also we have this uh, delay line glitch right here, which is about a 5% in magnitude, this little delay line glitch. Additionally, as I position the trace over the CRT graticule area, we'll find that down here we have approximately 11 to 12 percent of overshoot and aberration in the positive going transition. And in the negative going transition, we can't find it because I don't have enough positioning range to see it. Maybe by using the AC mode, there we go, you can see it right there. I'm AC coupled now and I'm able to position it up here. You can see that there again we're running approximately uh, 11 to 12 percent overshoot and aberration. Now, the Tectonics 2215A has plus and minus 12 divisions of dynamic range. And the PM3217 has only plus and minus 8 divisions of dynamic range. This allows us to see the entire signal on the CRT display we're on the PM3217, we couldn't do that. We had to go to AC coupling. So the bottom line then is for vertical amplifier performance, there's a big edge to the Tectonix 2215A over the PM3217. Now let's differentiate the time base operation of the 2215A and the 3217. As you can see, the 3217 only goes to 100 nanoseconds per division with the basic time base operation, or 10 nanoseconds per division with a times 10 mag on. Also, the 3217 has an A time base knob and a separate B time base knob. This allows you to get into operator traps quite easily. Notice that you can have the B time base run at a slower sweep speed than the A time base. Also notice that the intensified zone is barely distinguishable. You see here? If I turn the delay time multiplier, you might just barely see it. However, on the Tectonics 2215A, we have separate A and B intensity controls. Notice I can change my A intensity over here and also my B intensity. This way I can adjust my display to suit my measurement requirements. So we can see from this that the Tectonics 2215A has more convenient and easier to use time-based controls than the Philips PM3217. Now I've taken the covers off of both of these instruments so we can take a look at their construction techniques and uh, make some comparisons here. On the right here is the PM3217 and then on the left here is the Tech2215A. Let's talk about the PM3217 first. You notice that the PM3217 looks somewhat similar to the Tectonix 2215A, yet there are some differences. First of all, the PM3217 uses 15 connectors as opposed to only six on a Tech2215A. Uh, there are five edge circuit boards, the lowest number of all of our competition. And uh, also, you notice that the power supply is detached from the instrument. As a matter of fact, it unplugs when you take the instrument apart. This was done to meet the UL1244 requirements. The wires are usually fairly well secured so they don't flop all over the place. Uh, the circuit boards are glass epoxy circuit boards. There is no silk screening present so the troubleshooting would require a fairly good manual. Tectonix has silk screening on their circuit boards. Uh, if you can get a close up here, this cluster right in here, you'll find that the uh, potentiometers are not sealed. They're open frame potentiometers, and that's an indication of low cost manufacturing techniques. Uh, these are not, uh, in the long term, reliability not as good as what we use in the Tectronics 2215, which are, happen to be sealed. Um, 
It's one great big mother circuit board, which is mounted with mechanical fasteners, unlike the Japanese instruments. The CRT shield, as you can see, looks very much like what we've done at Tektronics. This is a one-piece shield. And uh, generally speaking, uh, of all of the competitions, this is the best made box. A couple of things I'd like to point out is that the uh, mechanical aluminum parts are not co-mated. They are co-mated on a Tech 2215 over here. And the reason for that is, the, is to reduce the chance of any environmental corrosion. Now, Tectonics meets uh, MIL T28800 rugged uh, environmental specifications, uh, not so with the Phillips 3217. And also, Tectonics has a three-year warranty on the 2215A, which includes the CRT, and the instrument, of course, can be serviced worldwide by any tech service center. Well, with Philips, uh, at the time he bought the instrument, it was a one-year warranty. It may be something else now, but in any case, you take your chances. So there you have it, the comparison of the Tectonics 2215A and the Philips PM3217. Thank you very much. I'm Roger Stenbach from the Portworld's Oscilloscope Marketing Group. Now today we'll be doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the Tectonics 2215A 60 MHz oscilloscope to the B&K 1570 70 MHz oscilloscope. Now the B&K 1570 is the only scope that's competing against the 2215 which is 70 MHz at this time. Uh, it has a variety of uh, very pretty front panel features. Uh, it does resemble the 465B to some extent, and it is a four-channel scope. Two of the channels, channel one and channel two, have a full attenuator, and channel three and channel four can be addressed via the uh, A and B external trigger inputs. It's a little bit awkward, but we'll get to that later. It does have some very important features missing. For instance, there is no beam find available to locate the trace on the screen. Uh, the triggers are position dependent, which means that once you reposition your waveform, uh, the triggers go away. We'll show you that later also. There is no line trigger available. Uh, the instrument has a lot of features otherwise, but some of them are poorly implemented. For instance, uh, the input is quite sensitive, as you can see. So I get my hand close to the attenuator right here. We get two or three divisions of noise. And that's true for both channels. Here's channel two. Maybe that's a clever way of uh, indicating beam find, or maybe we make up for the lack of a line trigger. Um, contrast that to the 2215A. I can put my hand near the uh, attenuators right here, and nothing happens to the traces. Now. Let's get into the real nitty-gritty of the evaluation. We'll, we'll, we'll be evaluating about four areas. The CRT display area, the trigger performance, we'll take a look at the vertical amplifier, some of the time-based functions, and then overall performance issues. So let's now start with the uh, display characteristics. Here I've connected a high rep rate square wave to both inputs. Go to maximum intensity and look at the display. From where I'm looking at it, the 2215A is slightly brighter, but the BNK 1570 is slightly sharper. The brightness right now is a function of the hold-off time at these high rep rate signals. Notice that the display does dim as I change hold-off, and of course the same thing on the BNK 1570. So now for high repetition rate waveforms, the 2215A is a little, it's a little brighter, and the B&K 1570 
is a little sharper. But where we are stressing the display uh, performance is when we look at low repetition rate pulses. And in order to do this, we'll have to dim the studio lights. We have here uh, an identical signal going to each instrument. Both instruments has the intensity and focus set for the brightest and sharpest possible trace. Both scopes are running at five nanoseconds per division by means of the horizontal magnifier. And uh, this pulse happens to be a 20 nanosecond wide pulse with a repetition rate of 100 kilohertz. If you take a close look at the 2215 now, you'll see that it's quite bright. We can distinguish the rising edges and the following edges. And uh, this would be very easy for a waveform measurement now. Let's, however, uh, take a look at the 1570 uh, over here. And notice uh, that it also is bright enough to make a measurement. OK, now under these circumstances, not too much of a problem. But notice what happens to the CRT brightness as I reduce my repetition rate. Here we're running at 10 kilohertz per division. And you notice that uh, now the leading and the falling edges of the display have dimmed considerably. Let's take a look at 2215A and see how it compares now. From what I can tell, it's just a little bit brighter. That makes sense because the 2215A has a 14 kilovolt CRT and the BNK 1570 has only a 12 kilovolt CRT. Let's reduce the amplitude, uh, I should say the rep rate now, down to 1 kilohertz. Here's a 1 kilohertz rep rate, and uh, it's getting quite dim now, yet we can still distinguish the rising and falling edges of the waveform, and we could still make a measurement if need be. Over here on the BNK 1570, uh, it's dimmer now. The rising and falling edges are actually dimmer, and we are approaching the limits of its measurement capability in terms of writing rate. I will now slowly reduce the repetition rate to the point where we can no longer, no longer make out the rising and falling edges. Right about here on my monitor, I really can't see the rising and falling edges anymore. So let's take a look at the 2215A and see how we're doing there. On a 2215A, we still have the capability of making a measurement. So now the bottom line in, in terms of display performance would go to Tectonics to the 2215A because of its better writing rate. Now let's take a look at the, the trigger capabilities of these two instruments. There are two items which we check on triggers. One is trigger performance and the other one is trigger features. Let's first take a look at the trigger performance in terms of trigger sensitivity. As you can see, I have identical signals again connected to these instruments. This is a 50 kilohertz sine wave. Uh, both scopes have a half a division trigger sensitivity spec. And now let's reduce the amplitude until we find a place at which they will not trigger. Again, both scopes are using their automatic operation and are set for best possible triggering. Right here, we have about a half a division, so they're both making specs. Going down further, this is less than a quarter of a division. Both scopes are making specs. And there, the BNK 1570 fails to trigger. I'll check the amplitude. And that's one, two and a half division, so it's triggering approximately 0.25 division. And the Tech 2215A, I'll bring it down over here. And it's triggering at 0.22 divisions. For all practical purposes, not a lot of difference in the trigger sensitivity specs for low frequencies. Now let's check the 60 megahertz triggering capability. Here we have a 60 megahertz signal going into each instrument. Now the uh, Tectonic 2215A is uh, specified at one division at 60 megahertz, and the BNK 1570 is specified at one and a half divisions at 70 megahertz. Nevertheless, let's find out what the actual trigger sensitivity really is. OK, here's a division. Both scopes are triggered. Here's about a half a division. And here the Tech 2215 fails to trigger. And that's the equivalent of about 5, so about 0.5 divisions the scope fails to trigger. Let's go back to the BNK 1570 now, see where it fails to trigger. 
right about there it fails to trigger, and that's the equivalent of about 0.4. So from this we learn that the trigger performance of these two instruments is very similar. The TEC 2215A triggers a little bit better at the low frequencies and the BNK 1570 is slightly better at 60 megahertz. So much for the trigger performance, but now let's check the trigger modes and see how these two scopes stack up. Now I have connected to both scopes now a 50 kilohertz sine wave. On the TEC 2215A, I've adjusted the trigger level so it'll trigger right here at about the 90% point. And of course, the same is true on the BNK 1570. Now, Tektronix offers peak to peak auto triggering, which means that if my amplitude changes, such as this, you can see that the scope remains triggered. And also, Tektronix offers uh, position independent triggers, which means that if I'm readjusting my positioning over here, the scope remains triggered. Very convenient and very nice. It makes it for uh, quick and easy waveform measurements. Let's see how the BNK 1570 fares under the same circumstances. Notice right here I'm changing my amplitude, and as soon as the amplitude drops below the trigger level point, zap, the scope does not trigger anymore. Okay. Another bad thing about the BNK 1570, if I reposition the trace such that it drops below the trigger level point, we lose triggering. Not really very nice. And another bad thing about it is, if you do it just right, the auto fails to function and the scope and the CRT screen goes completely blank, even though we're in the auto mode. Does not make for easy waveform measurements. So, as far as trigger modes goes, with the tectonics, you get peak-to-peak -peak auto triggering and position independent triggering. Not so with a BNK 1570, which would seriously uh, hamper your waveform measurements. Some more differences are that the BNK 1570 has a separate coupling switch for AC, LF reject, HF reject, DC, and video. Now the Tech 2215A has these uh, switches combined. Notice that the bandwidth limit also serves as an HF reject. And over here to the right, you'll see that the peak-to-peak uh, -peak auto mode, of course, is your AC coupling, and normal is DC coupling. So we have one less switch on 2215A, which makes it easier to operate. Let's go uh, back over here to the uh, B&K 1570 and take a look at the channel 3 and channel 4 operation. Now to operate these two channels, you have to be in the quad uh, vertical mode and also have to have a triggered channel as we have right here. Presently I'm triggered on channel one. You can see channel two, channel three, and channel four. And if you connect a signal to each one of these channels, we can see that here's channel two, here's channel three, and here's channel four. Now, you can only trigger on channel 1, 2, and 3 when you're in A sweep. To trigger on channel 4, you have to be in B sweep. This makes it somewhat inconvenient. Also, the sensitivity of channel 3 and channel 4 is not marked on the front panel. I have discovered empirically that it's 100 millivolts per division, and it's not adjustable. The position controls for channel 3 and channel 4 is not the trigger level control like for a trigger view function, but rather the position controls are located on the side of the instrument right back here. And as you can see, I can move these around. Unless the operator knows that they're back there, he will have a difficult time positioning these two channels. Now the B&K 1570 has these four channels over here. Let's talk about the uh, vertical performance then and, and see how useful these four channels really are. Now remember, the essence and heart of an oscilloscope is the vertical amplifier because it's a vertical amplifier which displays your signals and is used to make those measurements. I've connected uh, a 10 division square wave coming out of a PG502 into the 2215A. And notice that I'm able to position the waveform over the entire CRT graticule area. 
The 2215A has plus and minus 12 divisions of positioning range. That's very important when making logic type measurements. Notice that uh, right here we have a little, little bit of a wrinkle, and since each major division equals 10%, then that little wrinkle or overshoot or aberration uh, is about 2%. This is a well designed vertical system. Let's see how the BNK 1570 performs under the same conditions. Here's our 10 division signal. And notice right away that I, I am unable to position the top of the square wave nor the bottom of the square wave over the entire CRT graticular area. That's because the BNK 1570 has only plus and minus seven divisions of positioning range. I also notice that the degree of overshoot and aberration is horrendous. Remember, each major division equals 10%, and here we have 20% overshoot and aberrations. Now, although the vertical system on the BNK 1570 is specified at 3% accuracy, can you imagine what a 20% error in your amplitude can do for measurements at high frequencies? Well, not only is the BNK 1570's vertical performance somewhat uh, on the uh, undesirable side, let's take a look at what these other three channels give you. Notice <laughs> we have channel 2, channel 3, and channel 4 presently presented. Unfortunately, the usability of these channels is greatly compromised because we get these extra extraneous signals. That's what's called crosstalk. Really defeats the purpose of having these extra two channels. Let's see how the 2215A stacks up in crosstalk performance. Here's our 10 division signal. We'll go to channel 2 and channel 1 simultaneously. And notice that on channel 2, there's not a bit of crosstalk. So then for vertical amplifier performance and the ability to make accurate amplitude measurements, the 2215A is superior to the BNK 1570. Now let's see how well these two scopes perform in their time base operation. The most difficult test for a time base operation on a scope is the fastest sweep speed. In this particular case, it happens to be 5 nanoseconds per division with a times 10 mag activated. Let's take a look at the BNK 1570 and see how it does. Notice uh, we have these last two sine waves over here. We have two zero crossings, and we are measuring the time it takes to get from this zero crossing to that zero crossing. Now let's take a look at the beginning of the sweep and see how much different it is there. There we go. Notice that the zero crossing right now has approximately a 15% error, right? This region right here is about a 15% error in timing accuracy due to poor linearity. Now let's see what the accuracy is on a Tectonics 2215A under the same conditions at the maximum sweep speed. As you can see, on the zero crossings on the right side of the CRT, we have a zero crossing occurring in the positive direction every two divisions. Let's take a look at the beginning of the sweep. And notice we have a zero crossing occurring also every two division. And if I inspect it closely, I can see I have about a 2% error in my timing. So now for a time base performance, the 2215A is much better than the BNK 1570. Now I've taken the covers off of these two instruments, and here's the BNK 1570, and of course here's the Tech 2215A. The BNK 1570 has 14 circuit boards, 51 separate connectors, as you can see right here, over an excess of over 75 to 80 wires, as you can see right here. Uh, some of these boards are secured rather interestingly, as you can see. Here is a, a circuit board secured via a piece of masking tape. And the uh, part of the high voltage area right here is protected by means of another piece of tape. This fuse down here, huh, this is the primary of the power line. And of course, this would never make a UL. The front panel controls are all panel mounted and individually soldered in most cases, as we can see right here. Now, of course, the Tectonics 
15A has only really three circuit boards, six connectors, and makes UL1244 specifications, and of course VDE and mil T28800. The 2215A weighs only 13 and a half pounds as opposed to the almost 17 pounds of the B and K1570. Now the construction differences and a high reliability of the Tectonics 2215A allows us to offer the customer a three-year warranty, including the CRT. Well, with the B&K 1570, I don't know, I guess you take your chances. So there you have it. The Tectonics 2215A versus the B&K 1570. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Roger Stenbach from the Portables Oscilloscope Marketing Group, and we're here today to compare the Tectonics 2215A to the Leader LBO 517 50 megahertz oscilloscope. Now, here's the Leader LBO 517, and as you can see, it resembles uh, the old Tech 465 to some degree. We have time-based controls here and vertical controls here. Now, it isn't quite obvious, but this is a four-channel scope, believe it or not. Three of the channels are available in the front, and one is available in the rear. The B time-based controls are also available in the rear, and so are their adjustments. I'll turn it around for you. As you can see right here, here we have the B sweep triggering controls and the input available on the rear panel. And if we pull up over here to the right, we can see that we have channel three position controls and channel four position controls and implementation controls. In other words, pull for quad operation. Not exactly the most convenient way to implement a scope of this magnitude. This is the biggest of the scopes we've tested so far, and yet they've managed to put some of the more important controls on the rear panel. Nevertheless, let's discuss some of the uh, major operational features of these instruments, which are the CRT display characteristics, triggering, the vertical amplifier, the time-based operation, and the overall performance characteristics of this scope. Uh, some of the items missing on the leader LBO 517 are, for instance, there is no bandwidth limit. The maximum sensitivity on the calibrated verticals is only 5 millivolts per division at full bandwidth. And uh, we don't have a peak-to-peak -peak auto operation. Now let's take a look at the CRT performance. Now I have uh, set the intensity to maximum both scopes and I'm putting in a 100 kilohertz square wave. And from where I'm standing, the Tech 2215A is brighter than the LBO 517. Now that surprises me a little bit because the LBO 517 comes with a 20 kilovolt CRT and TEX 2215A is a 14 kilovolt CRT. Notice at this particular time that if I adjust my hold off time that it changes the brightness and that may explain partially why the brightness is dimmer on the LBO 517 because it may have a very long hold off time at these particular time base settings. What stresses the performance of the CRT, however, is low rep rate signals at high sweep speeds. So in order to check that performance, let's dim the studio lights. Okay, here's a 20 nanosecond wide pulse, 100 kilohertz rep rate applied to both the 2215A and the LBO 517. Now from where I'm standing, even at this high rep rate, the 2215A has got a brighter and sharper CRT trace than the LBO 517. 
I'm going to drop the rep rate now down to 10 kilohertz. And at this particular rep rate, it's obvious to me that the 2215A is, is much brighter than the LBO 517. Let's go down here one more step. Here's one kilohertz. And uh, I think we have to get a close-up now on the LBO 517 right here. You can see with some degree of imagination, you can probably see the rising edges. If you look real close, I have a hard time seeing them. Let's swing on over to the 2215A and see what that looks like. Now on the 2215A, I have a much easier time seeing the rising and falling edges of the CRT. Now one more interesting item about the display of the LBO 517 is the blanking characteristics. Notice that if I turn the intensity up all the way, there is not enough blanking voltage available to blank the retrace in the beginning of the trace. Not really a very good characteristic of, a, of an oscilloscope. So as far as CRT displays performance goes, even though we only have 14 kilovolts as opposed to 20 kilovolts, the Tektronix 2215A has a better and sharper and brighter display than the Leader LBO 517. Let's take a look at triggering performance now and let's see how that works. First, uh, we'll check out the trigger sensitivity at both low frequencies and high frequencies, and then we'll take a look at the modes. Here's a 50 kilohertz sine wave connected to each instrument, identical amplitudes. And remember, now these instruments are specced at a half a division at uh, these low frequencies. But let's find out what the actual sensitiv sensitivity really is. Here we go. Going down. Here's a half a division, so they're both making specs. Here's about a quarter of a division. Both of them are still triggered. And right about here, the LBO 517 fails to trigger. Even with readjusting the trigger level control, it's impossible for me to get another trigger. And that amplitude is equivalent to approximately 0.35 divisions. Let's see where the Tektronix 2215 fails to trigger. Now the 2215A right here fails to trigger, and there it is, 0.2 divisions. So for basic trigger sensitivity, the Tektronix 2215A actually triggers at a lower amplitude and is more sensitive than the leader LBO 517. But now let's check the high frequency trigger capability of these two instruments. Now I've connected a 60 megahertz sine wave to both instruments and the trigger sensitivity has been set for best possible triggering. Uh, the Tektronix 2215A has a one division spec at 60 megahertz and the LBO 517 has a one and a half division spec at 50 megahertz. Let's find out what the actual performance really is. Right here you can see on the LBO 517 that we get a degree of double triggering right there. So that's where it, it seems to limit out. And that's the equivalent of about 0.7 divisions at 60 megahertz. Not too bad. Let's see what the Tektonix 2215A does. Here we go. Reducing the amplitude further and further and further. Right there it fails to trigger. And that's the equivalent of about 0.5 divisions. So then for trigger sensitivity, the Tektonix 2215A has both better sensitivity at low frequencies than high frequencies than the leader LBO 517. Now let's check out some of the trigger modes. The Tektonix 2215A features a true peak-to-peak -peak auto trigger, which means it'll trigger as a function of the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the signal. Also, it means that I can adjust my trigger level control much easier because it will trigger over the entire rotational range of the level control for most signals. Contrast this to the LBO 517. Notice that it's quite possible for me to get multiple triggering or double triggering, and also the trigger level control is quite sensitive. Now, the kind of auto operation that the LBO 517 has can get you into trouble when you'd like the waveform to trigger at the same percentage of the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude and the amplitude is varying. As an example, you see on the 2215A, I've set the trigger level point at about the 90% point. Now as I change my amplitude, 
you can see that the scope remains triggered. But on the LBO 517, we have, using the same trigger point right here, if I change amplitudes now, as soon as the amplitude drops below the trigger level point, I lose triggering. So I'm forced to reset my trigger level point, my amplitude changes, I'm forced again to set my trigger level point. Not very convenient. Another inconvenience that the LBO 517 has is this very complicated set of push buttons in the trigger coupling and uh, trigger mode area. Notice we have one, two, three, four, five, six separate push buttons to do AC, HF reject, LF reject, DC, TV field, and TV horizontal. The TEC 2215, on the other hand, has the modes integrated into the mode switching. For instance, if I go to bandwidth limit, I am also now going into HF reject on my triggers. Also, if I am in peak-to-peak -peak auto, I am in, by default now AC coupled. If I go to normal, I am DC coupled. And when I push in both of these switches, then I am in TV trigger. So now for trigger performance, the Tectonics 2215A is better than the LBO 517. Now let's take a look at the vertical amplifier. As you know, the vertical amplifier is the heart of the oscilloscope. It is what displays your signals. Let's see how these two scopes stack up. Now I've connected a uh, 10 division amplitude fast rise square wave to the 2215A from a PG502. So each major division then is 10%. On a 2215A, I measure approximately 2% aberration on the front corner. I can position the trace completely all over the CRT graticule area for complete measurement capability. And the trace looks very nice. Let's check the LBO 517. First of all, I notice that I have a hard time triggering the scope. In other words, I can't trigger the scope. I have to go through some HF reject mode. Maybe right there I can trigger it. There, finally we got to trigger it. Notice that the waveform cannot be positioned over the entire graticular area. In other words, I've only got plus and minus six and a half of divisions of positioning range. Also notice that my overshoot and aberrations are more than 10% in the rising edge, and in the falling edge, they also are about 10%, depending how I position it. Also notice the degree of positioning effect on the front corner. Now, <laughs> again, we're having triggering problems on this instrument. Here we have a five division signal, and you can see on the five division signal that there's quite a bit of overshoot and aberrations also. Even with that small of a signal, we get considerable positioning effect. So as far as vertical amplifier performance goes, the Tectonics 2215A has only 2% aberrations and overshoot as opposed to the LBO 517 with its 11 to 12% overshoot and aberration. And also, as far as dynamic range goes, the Tectonics 2215A has plus and minus 12 divisions of positioning range as opposed to the leader LBO 517 with only plus and minus six and a half divisions of positioning range. So it's quite easy to see that the Tectonics 2215A is superior in the vertical amplifier performance to the LBO 517. Now let's take a look at the time-based performance and see what its accuracy is. I've connected a time mark generator to the LBO 517 and we go on five nanoseconds per division, purportedly at least. Uh, <laughs> These are 10 nanosecond markers, and we should have a marker every two divisions. But in reality, we have a marker every 1.6 divisions. So we've got about a 25% uh, a error right there. But what's significant about this, if you take a look at the zero crossing right here, and compare that zero crossing to the beginning of the sweep over here, we have in the neighborhood of an 85% nonlinearity which makes this scope just about useless for making any kind of rise time measurement or accurate timing measurement at the fastest sweep speeds. Let's see how the Tech 2215A stacks up to that same kind of a test. 
Now here's the sweep at 5 nanoseconds per division on a 2215A. Notice that we have a zero crossing every two divisions, which makes sense because we're putting in 10 nanosecond time markers. Also notice that the right side of the screen has the same timing as the left side of the screen. Now this is an indication of a well-designed time base and horizontal system. So as far as time base performance goes, the Tektronix 2215A is far superior to the Leader LBO 517. Now I've taken the covers off of these instruments so we can examine their construction technique. Now the LBO 517 is sort of the dinosaur of these portable oscilloscopes. It's built with relatively primitive uh, construction methods. They are 18 separate circuit boards. Most of the uh, controls are panel mounted. You can see one right here uh, that's quite loose. If you can get a close-up of that, you see that's, that's loose. And these wires are hand-wired on here. Uh, there are 38 separate connectors in various nooks and crannies of the oscilloscope. Uh, the oscilloscope construction, these metal pieces, are mostly steel. Uh, and the steel is not protected by any co-made coating or, or anodizing. The, uh, the scope would not make UL in today's standards. You can see that the primary is exposed. The power supply is quite conventional. As you can see, there's a great big power transformer over here. And all of this adds up to a, a relatively complex and old-fashioned instrument. Contrast this to the Tektronix 2215A. Only really three circuit boards and about five or six connectors. The Tek 2215A weighs in at 13 and a half pounds. Let's compare that to uh, the Lita LBO 517. This is the heaviest of the portable oscilloscopes that we've been comparing. It weighs in at a tremendous 25 and a half pounds. Now in terms of megahertz, this is uh, 2 megahertz per pound and the Tektronix 2215A is 4.6 megahertz per pound. Not only do you get more megahertz per pound, you also get VDE with the Tektronix 2215A. You get UL 1244 approval, CSA, and MIL T28800 specifications. Not so with the Lita LBO 517. And finally, the Tektronix 2215A and the Tektronix 2213A come with a three-year warranty, including the CRT. And they can also be serviced worldwide at any tech service center. Not so with the Leader LBO 517. Well, this wraps up the competitive comparison to the Tektronix 2215A and 13A. For further clarification and to get the latest information on this competitive comparison, contact your local friendly portable oscilloscope marketing group product support specialist. Thank you very much.